Hey, Gavin. Hey, Rishan. Could you try to turn your cameras on? Yeah. If that's possible. Uh, mine says unable to start because the host has stopped it. Yeah. Oh, my. oh gosh. Let me see. Mm -hmm. There are so many changes in Zoom these days. <laughs> Okay, so if you could try now, I think it should work better. Yep. Great, fantastic. So I think it's time for us to begin. Welcome everyone. Welcome Gavin, welcome Rashan to our webinar. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, yes. thank, you. thank you. Good, you? <laughs> Great. It's great to have you with us. There are so many teachers online watching us, waiting for our exchange on how to go beyond limitations when teaching remotely. So I'm super excited for today's webinar and thank you everyone um, who joined us today. Um, if we could start with like a short um, uh, housekeeping items and then perhaps we can do the round table, go around the table and discuss our perspectives. So those that are on the webinar know from where we're coming from and what kind of perspective we have on remote teaching. So if we if we could do that at the very beginning. So um, let me share my perspective first with you outside of um, EdTech as a co-founder of Explain Everything Else. I'm also a teacher. I provide lectures on, in universities in Europe for MBA students. So I kind of like see the, the remote teaching from both ends, from provider of a platform and user of a, pl a platform. How about you, Rishan? Uh, I too am one of the uh, founders of Explain Everything and I too uh, also work at a school. In fact, my primary responsibilities uh, are at a pre-K through uh, middle school uh, in the Northeast United States. And I also teach at the graduate school level. Great, thank you. How about you, Gavin? Me, well, uh, uh, a, long, a long many years of, of a bit of everything. Um, I started off working in, in uh, media, then I was a teacher for a long time in Ireland and the UK. I was then an ed tech consultant for many years, working with schools, training whole boroughs in, in South London. And oof, shooting on into the present day, I'm now CEO at, um, at Cocoon, where we are primarily online training for schools. So we were kind of doing a lot of the remote stuff before all this happened, but we've definitely been pushed into where everybody else is now and trying to figure out these new waters. Great, great three. Great for that. And I believe there are many that are waiting for hints and suggestions coming from you. Um, do you see my iPad screen by any chance? I see there was a disconnection. Yeah, I can see it now. Yep. It's gone. It's appearing and disappearing. Let me just change some <laughs> tables. You know, these are, you know, the realities of remote teaching. <laughs> it's it's a trust it? thing, yeah. It, want, it wants yes. you to click trust. Yeah, yes. there we go. Well, it, it's good to, to uh, troubleshoot live, Bart, because oh. people think that everyone else has it easy. So it's nice to <laughs> other people see uh, uh, even us having problems. It's reassuring. So as you see, it's it's a custom for us to troubleshoot online uh, in front of hundreds. So just thank you for your patience. Uh, before we begin our exchange, um, we have Kuba and Mariana today with us. Uh, they are uh, part of our team at Explain Everything, then they are helping us during today's exchange, uh, answering questions on Q&A, uh, during Q&A and on chat in the real time, as we've got so many requests and so many questions, we thought with their support, maybe we can you know, provide you with answers. Um, also, 
during the our conversations. So this is going to be like a separate discussion. If you have if you have additional questions, as we will answer some that were provided to us during registration, and thank you for um, providing us your questions when signing up for the webinar, you can count on Marianna and Kuba uh, to like follow up with you if there is no answer to your question, or just pay attention to a chat window because some of questions will be responded live there. Hi, Kuba. If you Everyone, confirm, you can hear yes, us. yes, I can hear you. I'm already answering some of your questions. So <laughs> thank you all for coming and um, and uh, enjoy the webinar. I'll be happy to answer your questions in the chat and in the Q and A. Great, fantastic. All right, let's let's dive straight into our topic of today. So, as you mentioned, Gavin. Uh, people think that, you know, from the perspective of those that create those solutions, it's so easy because, you know, we're okay with technology, but it's, it is obviously not. And we can tell this uh, from the perspective of being teachers as well. But I must admit, you know, being a part of EdDeck, we kind of like live in the future and, and we take things for granted. And with teachers, they s uh, sometimes share with us completely different perspective. And this is a topic of today. We're going to speak about um, limitations that are out there that are very real and they were shared with us uh, using many channels. We see those issues coming through Twitter, on Facebook, through emails. We have hundreds of emails. So we kind of like gathered everything for today in order to answer of those most important ones. But it's all around the topic of preparation for remote teaching. And the general consensus is that uh, we are kind of like not really prepared for this transition that happened so quickly. Guys, what do you think? Is that is that the same you see from your perspective? Um, well, before I jump in, I'll let you know your, your screen has gone, has gone pixelated again. Sorry. All right. We'll Sorry be trouble, trouble shooting one more time. Oh, Don't right. shoot the messenger. <laughs> um, we're, we're not prepared for this transition. Yeah, I mean, 100%. The vast majority of, I mean, if we're going to look, look at, at specifically education, I presume the question is, um, the vast majority of schools weren't ready for it. Um, like a huge percentage of schools worldwide weren't even registered on core platforms like Google or Office 365. Then a huge percentage of those that were, weren't using it to, to the right degree that would make this move to remote teaching something that it was, you know, not so stressful. So because, because of the little things like that, and people have had to really move fast to try and catch up. And I know a lot. I know we're going to talk about some of the barriers today. Lots of barriers have prevented that, but they've still, by and large, moved really fast. It's, it's been really impressive, but we, we have had to move fast. We have had to try and overcome barriers, which means we weren't ready for this transition very well at all. Certainly in in the education world, which I, I think it just it's such a traditional role in so many ways. For well, it's coming out of that now, but it has been a traditional role you know, that relies on that proximity to the students, your relationships with the students. And I don't know, I think one great thing from all this is going to be when we get back to the classrooms, eventually, um, teachers are really going to have seen the benefits of technology that for so many teachers, it's been, you know, this kind of boogeyman um, that people want me to learn technology, but why should I? And I think now people are realize, realizing, okay, that's why, <laughs> because, mm -hmm. because it makes my job easier. So yeah, so we, we weren't ready for it, but I, I think we're gonna see some huge benefits from being forced into it. What do you think, Rashan? Are we ready for what's happening currently? Well, I think the definitive, definitive answer is, well, of course not, because we're not fully aware of what is happening. So it would be a false statement to say we're ready for something that we can't fully understand beyond, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even a few hours out, you know, as far as predicting, um, what's going on or understanding it. Um, I think here is where like the mindset of a, of a learner, right? Somebody who can take in all of the inputs around them and reflect quickly and make decisions and decide and decide and make 
make decisions and designs for those whom uh, you serve or you're accountable to. Um, this is where that it's, it's really about mindset and how that kicks in and is able to function. I, I don't want to use the word succeed, uh, but actually function uh, under these basically impossible uh, conditions. So I, I don't think anybody, even the most prepared, it was couldn't have possibly been prepared because this is such a, uh, I mean, it's an, an extraordinary um, set of conditions all thrown in at once and at such rapid speed and scale. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I must tell you from my perspective, there are some universities that, that went through the process of accelerated adoption of solutions just to, you know, have remote teaching in place. The others are still, you know, not prepared to reach out uh, and connect with students um, at all. So that's maybe let's let's discuss this because this is quite a quite a barrier if you think about online learning. If you don't have, as uh, mentioned here, connectivity established between uh, teachers and students at all, and it's it is a reality for some uh, portion of schools, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that as I touched on a moment ago, the, the huge percentage that aren't set up on Office or or Google, um, which pretty much means they haven't got any email addresses or any form of Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, which is really your your foundations for for any kind of uh, communication. Just the basic the, the basic handing out of work, collection of work, that level of communication with students. Um, yeah, um, so, so, sorry, it's got pixelated, I'm trying to read it again, but I forget, teachers can't get, yeah, can't get hold of students, yeah, yeah, and, and, and that, is, that, that, is an, that is an issue, um, and uh, I, 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 know, I know, Bart, you've got our, our, our boot camp link there somewhere later on, but just to let people know that there's a little document, if I don't, if, I don't know if Bart has a link for it already, but if we don't share it now, you can get it there anyway. It's just a document of kind of three stages of, of what, how you can communicate with students because there's kind of three realms you're probably in. One is, um, let me have got them here somewhere. Uh, one is, do, do, do your students uh, have an email address, usernames, and, are, and, and are, are using them? In that case, it's pretty easy to, to communicate, get them set up in Classroom. Scenario two then would be they have usernames but don't actually use them. So then that's, that's a new barrier we have to try and overcome. And then the, the toughest one then is they don't have usernames or aren't even registered on, 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 on Google at all. So th there's kind of three scenarios there and um, without going to any huge level of detail, like I said, I can, I can share out that document with people. It, it is part of the boot camp as well. And you, you, you'll get it when you register, but it's just there. And it's, they're, they're, they are easily enough solved um, from a technical perspective. It's the practicalities of communicating with, with parents, etc. And you know, you you can get consent forms signed. You can do all that kind of stuff. It's just a few practicalities that you have to consider. But it's you know, it's doable. But without this foundation, there's little we can do. Is that Rashawn? Right. So you have to. I mean, whenever we're talking about teaching and learning under normal conditions, that you're almost assuming a certain other set of conditions that are in place, including touch points you know, with the students and or their caregivers or families. And so if that's like the first thing that's broken, right, or disrupted because of uh, an interruption like this, uh, you almost have to go back to the basics and like define, all right, what is our communication stack? Like what, what is the, and what is the one that has the highest uh, entry point for our entire population? And then you could of course figure out how do you up-level that? How do you, how do you uh, ramp that up and bring people along with you? so that you can start to now think about better or more ways to engage students. But if you're, if you're not able to connect with the families, you know, even if it's by mail or post or uh, pigeon or something, mm -hmm. like something to get messaging out and establish that communication line, like how can you possibly talk about instruction, right? If you can't even get a hold of people to tell them where to go first. So, um, I mean, it seems obvious, but like so often it feels like a, exciting to look towards like, oh, here are all these possibilities for remote or distance learning. But if you haven't first solved the, hey, this is how we actually at the baseline just get in touch and that you feel mm -hmm. a high degree of confidence, it's not fair to start moving on before you've not established that baseline. Absolutely. Yeah, 
it's sorry, I was just just gonna say it's so true. I mean, it's it's often people look for a technical solution to a practical problem, and you know, a lot of those problems are practical first. They will become a technical one. We need to solve the, the practical stuff first because you know, no technology is good enough to do anything if you can't, as Rishan said, yes. you can't get in touch with anybody. But then again, if we already have access, even limited access and connectivity with our students, then you know what we hear quite often is that learners work at different speed at different times, and it's hard to like you know uh, control this this environment, new environment for learning. What are your suggestions, guys, for this topic? Well, well, this is true even in a brick and mortar setting that students learn in different ways and with different tendencies and different styles. Mm -hmm. So I think you know the, uh, mm -hmm. a mindset towards differentiated instruction, differentiated curriculum um, is almost even more true now. And then you also have to add this layer um, of like, uh, like situational differentiation, right? Which is not necessarily tied to cognitive or uh, content or prior knowledge abilities, but rather like external conditions that might impact how a student can engage. And like, that's how that's kind of the new way or the this most sensible way uh, to, to design learning experiences. I think what's challenging is if, if your mindset wasn't already one that valued or recognized like <clears throat> the importance of that kind of student-centered uh, approach, you know, before you can even think about differentiating over distance, you first have to come to terms with the, the value and importance of differentiated learning regardless of the conditions. And now, uh, try to apply them for distance. Right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I look at that problem. Um, I, I, I almost air quote it because I just, I just genuinely see like the opportunity there, and I won't repeat. I'll try not to repeat what Rashan said about differentiation too much. But I mean, it, it's such an opportunity. Say, for instance, your your teachers are just getting started with explain everything, and they're they're creating explainer videos. I mean, if I'm class teaching. I introduce my lesson. I may get a chance to listen to a few children uh, raise their hand and ask me to repeat a certain part of it. But if they've got an explainer video, they can watch it 10, 15 times if they need to. So yeah, they're going to work at different speeds. Perfect. You know, that is often a problem in the classroom. This group is going too fast. This group needs extra support. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities here. I know one of our um from our, our previous boot camp one teacher mentioned in, in one of our q a sessions that one thing that she'd found really nice was opportunities such as um i mentioned to you earlier bart about using the likes of google forms to survey how students are feeling and what she found there was that she was getting to know students in ways that she never would have done in the classroom because they were they were telling her they were miserable whereas when you ask kids how they are in a classroom they may not want to or may not get the opportunity to say look i'm miserable life's terrible at home and finding school terrible because of a b and c but they were being this honest this honest by uh google form so i i i think um yeah it's different speeds and different times but but i think to echo on to what rishan said there's opportunity there if you really take what differentiation really means as a teacher uh, and apply that and use it say for instance in in google classroom as well like google, google classroom and explain everything alone, just provides so many opportunities for turning that, I'm going to air quote this time, for turning that problem into, uh -huh. an, opportunity, into an opportunity. I mean, with Google Classroom even, um, you can, you know, you can create an assignment and split your classes into three, four different groups and then send that assignment out on different, different difficulty levels to your, to your different students. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I, I mean, it's, there's, there's, and it's, it's not that difficult to do, you know. Uh, it, it, again, it's a, I don't want to keep on harping on about the boot camp, but it's, it's, it's something we, we, we cover there as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think, yes, they learn at different speeds and different times. They always have done, um, well, times now they're in, in the class, but I don't know. You know, it's, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there if you, if you seize it. Rashawn, are, are there any practical scenarios that you would suggest for teachers that would want to think more about, about differentiation? What would be like, you know, the top three steps they should follow if there's such a list? Uh, I don't know if there's such a list, but I can at least provide 
um, kind of a, a strategy or an approach. Can I share my screen? Will that work? Sure. Um, let me see. Let's see. Mm -hmm. and... Is that visible? Yes, it is. All right. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go to a blank slide. So I I, I would say like when thinking about differentiation at the point when you're designing or maybe you're kind of re redesigning something that already exists is figure out how you can, at the point that you're creating or designing it, have it function in multiple ways so that you're working with the same starting content, um, but then have it have multiple ways that it can be presented and accessed so that you're not creating like four separate, you know, independent tasks, but rather mm -hmm. you're doing most of the heavy lifting at this phase and then you're, you're designing out from there. So, you know, I'll give a more concrete example here. Let me just move this over. So like, I'm just gonna use like an early elementary math example. So I'm gonna, here's like a little uh, block. Sorry, my, my daughter is like jumping on a trampoline here. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's a, you know, that's a <laughs> remote work for you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. More, more, more real world troubleshooting. <laughs> yeah. So, so th this is a very rough uh, base 10 block. Let me just make sure I've actually got 10 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it doesn't exactly mirror um, what I might use in the classroom. But I just, you know, I've made a bunch here now. And I'm going to also make like a single unit block. So you're, you're just kind of seeing me talking out loud as I uh, construct some digital uh, artifacts or, or materials for use uh, in another purpose. Mm -hmm. So I've made a square. I'm going to duplicate that a bunch of times. Um, here's a little trick. I'm going to oh. arrange line left, line top. Nice. So now you have a stack. A line left, a line top. So now it looks like a stack, but there's actually a, a bunch there. So like. This might be, I started, maybe I'll also like create a little bit of space. I'm doing this hand drawn because um, we're going to model some addition. So like I basically got right now, not so pretty, but functional template for um, modeling or practicing some basic like addition and being able to demonstrate um, some form of understanding. So now that I've created that once, I can actually duplicate this a bunch of times Uh, in case I want it for different things. So for example, I might first want to model some form of addition. So let me just say like, um, you know, three plus 11. And I'm gonna hit record. I'm not gonna record my audio here. Uh, okay, students, this is how we can use these manipulatives to demonstrate this addition. So first, we're gonna take three unit pieces and we've got two numbers here. We've got a tens and a one. So I'm gonna take one 10 and one one and now let's see what I got. Actually, let me move these over here. And now I can count up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I get 14. So in 30 seconds, I've just modeled a strategy. Now we can argue about the effectiveness of this strategy in a, in a different setting, but now I've got um, a video that I've made. But I could also just have, oh, let me hide that. I could add some text here, you know, use these 10 blocks. Maybe I'll duplicate that. Use these uh, unit blocks. So I'm doing this in like super, rap super rapid fire while also sure, live, sure. adding additional pressure, of course. Um, but so that video that I'd created before, imagine my written instructions are better. I could also, uh, this is asking me to leave it. Uh, why not? I'll, I'll rejoin. I could send this, uh, I'm going to just choose this one page, as a document. So, so now imagine there, I'm worried about connectivity or capacity. I can now create this as a PDF or even as a printout that could be a material um, sent to somebody, right? So that they could at least see some sort of static model of this principle and try to engage uh, as best as they can. I'm reconnecting post export. Um, so right now, the same content very quickly, I've used it in two settings. I've made a video and I've made a piece of static instruction. I could also send this blank one. Now, all of a sudden, let's say 12 plus seven. 
I could export this as a single page. And now it becomes a sheet that a student can hand draw and write upon to show their modeling of this function. Or I could export this uh, as a project. So somebody uh, who can open this up on a device, a Chromebook, a laptop, an iPad, whatever, could actually model the same exact behavior that I, that I just showed. So if we go back to what I was talking about, right? I would created one artifact, right? With, with those things and a problem. And then I'd created a, an instructional video. I'd created uh, a document handout. I'd created like a worksheet. And I'd also created like an interactive opportunity. And mm -hmm. all of the, the effort was front loaded in the design. But now I've created four situationally differentiated entry points for somebody to engage with this particular uh, concept or skill. That's, that's a great illustration, how to overcome that limitation. But here's the big thing. I mean, that was also one of the most uh, often raised uh, um, questions and problems uh, that we, we hear from teachers. Sometimes policies are like roadblocks, pre preventing teachers from adopting technology that can mediate this exchange. So those results that you show in your illustration, they need to be carried over between teacher and student. And sometimes, you know, there are limits in what kind of technology you can use. There are limits what kind of uh, connections you can make. So is there actually any suggestion from you guys how to overcome that problem? Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let, I'll let Gavin speak first and I'll, I'll add on to what he says. <laughs> okay, okay. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I've had to think about th about this one, and yeah, again, it, it's it's the practical problems coming ahead of, of the technical problems. Um, I mean, so if 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 policies are preventing you use a host of platforms, uh, it really is going to come down to what platforms are being are being prevented, how many of them there are, how many are your priority. Like, so much of it is is going to be very specific to your school, and we could spend the whole hour just talking with one teacher about it. So I guess in general, the best thing is, uh, and again, <laughs> back to the boot camp. Um, what we focus on there is just just a core selection of platforms, um, because you don't want to have too many be learning too many platforms for many reasons. But if you pick a couple of platforms that you know are going to be really good and going to be really helpful for you and really effective for engaging your students, know what they are first, identify them be able to explain why you need to use them and then make your case to the, to the powers that be. And you say, look, this is all we want to use. If it's just explain everything or explain everything in Google Classroom, look, it's just these. If I can use these with my students, here are the benefits. So I guess it, that's it. it it's be, be focused in what you want, know why you want it, and then try and make the case and overcome, overcome the policies as, as best you can. Um, I, I, think, I, I think that's great. I mean, your advice and your readiness to support teacher in the pro teachers uh, in the process of transformation is is very much needed. So we'll put a link into the follow up email um, after this webinar, and we can put it in the chat uh, window for those that would want to sign up for the webinars um, of Cocoon. So thank you for for raising that um, as a possibility. Uh, what is your take, Rashawn, on this? limitation i mean it, it this is far more like an organizational regional cultural thing than it is anything to do with technology and so mm -hmm. i guess there's there's like two directions you can go one would be to you know organically try to develop the relationships and the evidence of why change in policy uh is necessary um and go through like the existing decision making channels and you know that also respects that you know organizational leaders are also dealing with massive amounts of change too and are juggling a lot of things too um and that's that's path a path b is to like be just completely subversive and like go go rogue and figure out ways to make it work in order to drum up even greater evidence and urgency but like all the, both choices have affordances and limitations right as far as the the near term and the long term effects and you know this is where discernment comes in as far as judging what's going to be the best for the children. And like, if that's driving your judgment, it's hard to go wrong, um, you know, because they're 
they're the stakeholders who don't have much agency in what schools are deciding or not deciding to do. So if your mindset is committed to like what's what's going to be best for the students, um, that that'll probably be helpful in guiding <laughs> which of those two suggested paths you might take. Absolutely. So those are great suggestions. I would suggest you use uh, path A, <laughs> path number one. <laughs> but it's out for the angel on the shoulder. And Rashawn is a devil. Like it's an old Looney Tunes yeah, cartoon. Yeah. And like, be good, be good. Rashawn's like, no, do this. <laughs> It'll get you there quicker. <laughs> But then again, regardless of which path you choose, uh, building confidence and using tools also takes time, right? We are so surprised with this situation. I mean, speaking from the perspective of teachers, uh, most of us um, are so surprised with this situation. It just takes time. What do you think? What are the easy steps to build the confidence to use the whiteboard as we're doing now during this, uh, uh, this webinar? or when teaching on Teams, Zoom, Hangouts, or any other platform to be you know, efficient in instructional delivery or group assignments? So step one is to go to Gavin's boot camp, And then step two <laughs> is, I think you set up a culture where, you know, uh -huh. if you show some vulnerability and like let, you know, confidence is also related to kind of the performance aspect in your audience. Your, your confidence is relative to like the setting in which you are performing and how confident you are or not, right? Like that's that's where that pressure is felt. So whatever you can do to establish the norms and quote safety where you can push harder and take some risks and not be, or, or be imperfect um, in front of your audiences, I think that will go a long way and a lot further than simply like holding up and just like practicing and trying to like skill up on every single thing. And then maybe you find like Gavin said before, you find just a couple of things uh, to focus on rather than trying to do 20 million things and let those be the things that you develop that confidence around. Yeah, I'm, 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 whatever Rashawn said there, I'm thinking about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook's mantra. It used to be move fast and break things. Now it's move fast with, someone will correct me, move fast with, with a, a strong infrastructure. <laughs> I think we can take a little bit from, from, from Zuckerberg. I, I think that kind of works. I think, you know, it, you got to know, you got to just pick a select few things. There's a lot of noise out there, a lot of, you know, and there are a lot of good platforms, but you can't use all of them. So you got to, you got to, you got to shut your ears. You got to find the ones that, that suit you and that suit your teaching style, that suit your needs. Uh, and just, and, and like Rashan said, just, you know, you don't have to be perfect at them, you know, give it a go. And, you know, students, love to see teachers make a mess of things so even if it's live and you, you make a mess you go look you know i'm not perfect either you know and and even in this situation look guys covid's tough for me i'm an i i'm isolated and you know it's tough and i'm trying new things now as well so there's definitely no shame in anything going wrong live or otherwise but don't put yourself under stress ultimately really all you want to do at the bare minimum is digitize what you normally do which is get work to students, engage the students, and get stuff back from students, and, and keep, that, keep that loop going. And that really is, at its bare essentials, all you need to do. So what tools are gonna to let you do that? And once you can do that, great. Now let's try one or two other tools you think might be really cool and really helpful. But at least get yourself confident, get that foundation. I mentioned to you earlier, Bart, that idea of, of having the, the foundation um, which will be uh, Google for education, you know, just being strong on that and then knowing that I can share my explainer videos and explain everything really easily. I can, you know, I, I can talk to students through how to make their own explainer videos and then the students can then explain their thought processes to me via explain everything, you know, and, and if it turns out to be a tool everyone loves, then we can, as everyone knows, explain everything is just, just so deep you can go with it. So we can keep on going, going, and going, but start at the start. Make a simple explainer video. Make a stream a live whiteboard and talk to students through a process. Um, just start at the start and go that's easy great. on yourself. Go easy on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good advice. And for those that would want to read about those steps uh, from explainer video to more advanced 
um, use of whiteboard. We do have those articles on the blog. We can put links to them uh, in a follow-up email. So that was the foundation that you mentioned, Gavin. That that's the slide that I received from you. Is that is that? Yeah, that correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like like a three-tier approach, where tier one is just have your strong foundations, which would be G Suite or Office three six five. Right. Mm -hmm. From there, you pick a very select few specialist platforms. Um, in this case here, I just have to explain everything because, you know, just one is plenty. If do one well rather than do five badly and stressfully and then do nothing. I, all the time we see teachers who want to do four or five, six things a week later. It's like, oh, technology is the enemy. It's like, Don't try six things. Just try, try one, get confident with it, get happy with it. Once you're working, once you're engaging students, once you can see a purposeful teaching and learning reason for it being in your life, great. And you're happy with it, great. Get better with that and or bring a second one into your life. Uh, and then our third tier is engaging students. So ultimately, all this is, is to engage, create engaging learning. So that's strong foundations, specialist ones that are really going to suit your style. All of this is going to create engaging teaching and learning. I must admit that most questions we received from those that signed up to our webinar were about engagement, how to create environment for engagement. So, so let's take remaining time of our webinar and devote it to answer questions that we received. We actually have them here on slides. So if I move to one of many slides where we listed those questions. Hey, Paul, um, do you want we, me to share my screen? Because I think it's coming out a little pixelated again. To, um... Sure. Yes. Yes. Let's troubleshoot more time. So I'll stop sharing in my end. If you could share your screen, and in the meantime, let me ask Kuba, how are we doing with answering question on the chat? Um, we're doing pretty fine. Hopefully, if you if you're not happy, please let me know. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 answering uh, some questions that appeared here in Q and A. Um, I've left some for you, folks, so you can answer. Um, so. We, Actually, there's one for uh, Gavin uh, and from Angelica that, that, that towards what, what he said at the beginning. And she says, Gavin, I com uh, completely agree. Teachers have had many opportunities to learn new technology. I work in a school that has one-to-one -one devices. Unfortunately, not all of these tools have been used effectively in the past five years. Do you find this, uh, this is a common situation? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. Um, and what, what I find is common as well is that so many teachers just think the school down the road is doing these things well. Um, definitely the rule, I mean, there, there are so many schools who are like really are flying at everything they're doing with regards to technology. But my vast experience is that they're the exception. And I'm talking globally here, not just US or UK. Uh, the ones that are really are flying uh, are in fifth gear all the time with every platform or with any platform to have every teacher confident and really using it well, they're, they're the exception. Um, so lots of schools invest in technology. They invest, they invest, they invest because that looks good, but they, what they don't invest properly in is, is the training of the teachers and just giving teachers that journey to an, an achievable journey. Again, going back to what we said earlier, you know, make things easy. Easy doesn't have to mean you do, you do nothing. It just means it's enjoyable. It's achievable at a pace where you're just moving forward nicely. But it's just not done enough in schools that they give the teachers a journey and they and they invest that in the trainers and the training and they move the teachers along on a termally and yearly basis. And they have that vision for the school and a vision for their teachers and a support for the different confidence and different skill levels in their staff. It's, it's just not done enough. Even schools and, and often schools that invest heavy. I think a lot of schools invest heavy um, in the hardware side of things because they think it's it, it shows they're a techie school, but what's the point if they become you know glorified paperweights? So you aren't, your school isn't the exception. The exception is, from my experience, a lot of schools, the exception is the schools that are brilliant at everything. Nice. Mind. Thanks for sharing that, um, Gavin. So let's look at those questions that we have now on <laughs> yeah. the 
screen. I see Rashawn that I'm you're- I'm scribbling some notes and I realize they're completely <laughs> legible. That is not pixelation, that is my handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would but, you like to address the first one? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So this is a very important, yeah. I think, I think the answer, first of all, it depends, oh. like I think on like region and, and where you are, though my answer is probably, yes, it is probably too early connected to what I shared before, we, the, the condition- The return to the, to the, to the school is too early. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, right. yeah, I mean, I think you have to start scenario planning, but I just don't think you can be certain of which scenario um, is most likely. I think to assign confidence um, in any of the scenarios would be uh, faulty logic. It, it's just too far. I mean, it's May now. So if your school begins in August or September uh, in normal years, or you're even thinking about returning in June, um, for the rest of this school year, um, it seems early. Uh, however, no matter what scenario you're in, I think kind of a bottom up planning approach is so like figure out like what's going to be the most, the broadest baseline of what, um, of what, how people are going to be engaging. So in this situation where it's like this mix or half hybrid or whatever, I would say you put all your design thoughts into the, dis the distance element. And then whatever you're able to extract from face-to-face -face connections, that becomes a layer on top or an added benefit mm -hmm. rather than trying to design for something that's going to have like half groups in, half groups out. You might have populations weaving in and out because of illnesses or um, other restrictions. Maybe some families just don't feel comfortable yet. Um, and it's hard to design for that. So like you, you just never know how the conditions are going to change. But if your foundation of like, all right, in the worst circumstance, everybody is back at distance. Um, let's, let's create that well. But I also think, um, and this relates to somebody's question uh, down here, that like when, when this situation hit, most schools were in, uh, already had several months of relationships and operations and other routines established. So even moving into a distance setting, um, you, you could try to build off of some of that continuity and those pre-existing relationships when you're starting a new cycle, a new academic or school cycle, um, there's a lot of new routine building and new norm setting uh, that normally happens in August or September. So I, it, it demands a different kind of startup uh, of the school year. Mm -hmm. And honestly, one that probably should not look like your normal structure of how uh, people uh, are grouped and organized. It, 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 it doesn't make sense. And it's not probably the most efficient use of resources to still say like, oh, well, we'll have one teacher per 20 X kids. Um, well, yeah, that makes sense in a brick and mortar setting because of the classroom size or even be, maybe because of uh, state or, or regional mandates as far as uh, ratios. But that, that may be less true in a distance setting. You might be able to have like a crack team of two fifth grade teachers who can actually support 200 students in a distance setting in a different way. And then you have a different layer that's being prepared for either the half return, a hybrid return, or that on-ramp to like a, a normal return. So that that's my perspective on, on those two questions. And and how do you how do you call this mode of teaching hybrid teaching? I, mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get caught up in the jargon. Right. Like people saying hybrid, mm -hmm. high flex is another <laughs> word I've seen. Like, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's fun to come up with the clever descriptors to give a name to things, but um, it it ha whatever it is, it has to be you have to build in adaptation and iteration into it. You have to build in um, almost structured pause moments so that you can like actually pause and reflect and refine because that's the only way you're gonna make it better, right? If you just go at it and be like, oh, we designed it. We spent a month designing it in July and like, this is what we're doing. But if the conditions are dramatically different in October, you have to have room to be like, hey, hit the pause button. Let's, let's retool and adjust. And now let's move forward again. If you put that into your design from the start, it doesn't feel like a scramble or a disruption when those pause moments come. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I wanted to get your take on this question here. Right. Let me just zoom in and uh, provide those that are just uh, listening to us um, a question. So. It is related to, to this one directional instructional delivery. Without receiving any answers from students when teaching remotely, obviously, we don't know if they are listening, writing, or if, they don't, or, if they're, or if they're doing something during the lesson. And I actually have a good illustration. This is a real life example of teaching taking place. So let me just illustrate what you see on this video here. That's the teacher. These are the students. 
obviously a lot is going on in the chat window. Without teaching being, you know, aware of this situation, someone streams uh, uh, <laughs> a game during the lesson and teacher is not aware. And I've heard about situation where there's like an alternative channel of communication between students, students on a different communicator, not us here and during these lessons, uh, during this lesson. So what is your advice? How to work with this constraint that teachers might not be even aware to and were not, uh, have trouble getting attention of students for the lesson? I mean, that's that's clearly um, this teacher is doing live teaching, um, which, yeah, it's it's tough. Um, it's it, it's a tough thing to do to expect all 30 kids in the class to be listening or to put that pressure on yourself to, to, to think they're listening. So um, I don't have an easy answer for you, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I think there's huge benefits to asynchronous teaching. Um, for instance, providing through Microsoft Teams, um, putting the explainer videos up there, putting the tasks up there, because you mentioned things like the connection not being good. So if the connection isn't good and you have problems with audio and video, I mean, maybe asynchronous teaching is, is the best way to go for you. And asynchronous, obviously, um, what I mean, mean by that, uh, just because I know it's an international audience, it's not live teaching. So, I mean, if I put, if I have my, say, four or five key concepts, I'm, I'm thinking elementary teaching here, but I know it's different, but it, just adapt for, for your own role. But if you have what your core things you want to communicate with the students during the week, have them as explainer videos. How on Teams or Classroom, put up some assignments. And then, because you mentioned here about receiving answers from students, we don't know if they're listening or writing or doing it something else. I mean, you can engage with them really well using the comment features on Word and, like, and Google Docs, you know, and you can really, you, you can see what they're doing. You can engage with them on any specific part of a document. Uh, like you can, you can put a comment on an exact word or a sentence, ask them what they mean. And then they can reply to you in a comment and you get a whole a whole dialogue going. So uh, if you are using Teams and uh, the issues you, you have there look like look pretty troublesome, I, I would I would suggest not not doing your lessons live and uh, or or if you have to do them, maybe it's a school policy thing where you have to do them live, I would look at ways around that where you're not actually um, perhaps putting the explainer video live at a certain time giving them a task and then you can look at them you if it's word or, or docs you can actually see them typing oops i'll put it in bang uh you can see them typing and you can engage with them live as, as they work you know so um i i think that kind of solution there might work better than trying to actually speak to them for a full, a full school day i hope they're listening because in fairness i mean put yourself on the other side of things it must be difficult to sit there and look at a screen and listen to your teacher all day long I know if I was a kid, I'd, I'd want to mess and I, I'd, want, I'd want to find something I shouldn't be doing and share it if I possibly could. Um, so I, I think we really have to get ourselves into the mindset of these kids who have lost all their social channels, you know, to a large extent. Life's pretty tough for them. So, I mean, they have this, this and the, if it's if teenagers, they have this energy that they need to get out. And, you know, if they're a messer or whatever it might be, they're going to get it out. So, I think we need to adapt our teaching styles as much as possible, adapt to specific situations like your internet connections. Um, yeah, I, ho I hope that answers it. I hope I didn't speak for too long. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. Roshana, what is your take? Yeah, I, I, it's a losing battle if you're gonna try to control something that is just not controllable. I think, but if you've got kind of the the approach, right? That even, you know, I, I saw somebody in, in the chat or the Q and A, you know, there are tools where you can like um, quote lockdown or like force what a user is seeing to a degree. But as long as it's done from the perspective, like that's not being done for the teacher, but it's actually being done to, to help the students, right? Because sometimes kids do need help, like, or just be like, hey, use, use your video chat in full screen mode. Or like, you look, figure out how do you almost self-regulate around some of these things. like that's going to actually have a longer term win um, for young people, but you have to, you have to build up to that, right? You, if, if from day one, you're trying to like control people's behavior from miles and miles apart, 
it, it's never going to be good. And then I would also, yeah, you don't want to be in these long extended synchronous sessions, but rather like do what can only be done synchronously, like something interactive, mm. conversational, feedback, small group, whatever it is, right? But if it's just one directional, it, synchronous probably isn't the right medium. Now, Gavin referred to that, you know, some organizations might be requiring that kind of seat time. And at that point, it's actually fulfilling more of like supervision of children than it is actually teaching of children, right? Because to a degree, that is a service that in-person schools provide for families that during the hours that kids are at school, they are being supervised by employees of the school in addition to being taught and all of those other things. So mm -hmm. it seems like, oh, synchronous now becomes this kind of virtual supervision, but that's, that's not, it's actually not good uh, for that, right? Like you have to set up a different kind of scenario if like that's the primary goal you're trying to uh, achieve. So it, it's tough, there is no good answer. Um, and this is one of those things that no matter, no matter what best attempt or optimal things you do, it's still gonna be hard, right? It might be less hard, yes. but it's, mm -hmm. always, it's always going to be hard. Absolutely, yeah. but that was a that was a tough one. So I <laughs> choose the very top question to hear. There are some easier questions coming to us. One of them is listed here. Uh, basic. This it's a, it's a question about learning the basics of explain everything. Obviously, we're not doing this during this webinar, but we can suggest to sign up for Gavin's Bootcamp or come to our other webinars that we do regularly. You can sign up. Um, on our product page or just let us know on chat window that you want to be informed about the uh, next upcoming webinar on basics and we'll be happy to accommodate you. Um, so yeah, maybe let's move to one more slide. We still have some time. Yeah, that's a good question here. So. Uh, Rashad, oh, sorry, which slide are we on? Eight? Yeah, slide number eight is great. How effective is virtual class for very young learners? What is your take on this uh, question, guys? <laughs> not very. Oh, that's not <laughs> very really thicker. Not easy. Very. Easy. <laughs> Big E A S Y. Can't, can't you do it? <laughs> I mean, just make sure, make sure they all sit still for the whole day. Okay, that's 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 you should be able to do that. Uh, it's it's uh, with, with young learners. Yeah, I mean, we're going to come back to policies here, and I, I pray and hope that the policies in your school are not making you teach them synchronously for the whole day. Um, personally, if I was teaching elementary still, um, what I would be looking to do is like I mentioned, I have my core concept. So say, for instance, we're doing tens and ones or tens and units like Rishan did earlier. I'd have an explainer video for that. Um, and maybe we're doing states of, no, that's, that's too old. But anyway, I'm doing my journey to the school or whatever we're doing. I have my, my five core things. I create my explainer videos. I would then communicate these with the parents via Google Classroom or even, I know one of our schools actually use the school website that they, they, they will put up um, the explainer videos for the week on the website. The parents can look at those. As Rashan said earlier, they get to see the exact processes that you use as, as a teacher, um, which is really important because otherwise they're going to go teaching tens and tens and ones, tens and units the way they learned 20 years ago, which may be, you know, nothing like what you want the kids to do. So, um, yeah, I, I think just have, have those core concepts, have them easy for the parents to consume, um, try and keep them fun. Uh, obviously, uh, you have to anyway for, for that age group, but uh, make them fun for the parents, make them achievable for parents, make the par empower the parents so they don't look at it. You know, a lot of parents feel intimidated by teachers and teaching and think it's a mystical thing and, you know, something they can't do. So I think if, if, if you can make videos that make the parents feel that little bit, bit happy about it and confident with it, um, that, that for me is, is, the, is the way to do this. Uh, I mean, at that age group, the main thing is that they're happy from, from my personal point of view. You know, a, a nice bit of cognitive development and academic goals is great and it'll certainly help the parents structure the day for the kids. But let's be honest, they're four and five years, years of age. Um, the main thing is that they're happy during these times and they aren't stressed out and their parents aren't stressed out. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll ch ch chime in for a second. I want to thank you uh, for everyone who part participated in the chat. It's a, so, so many great suggestions and, and, and questions and, um, and talk between you uh, folks out there. Um, there is one question for Gavin um, about your bootcamp. So sorry for, for uh, I just want, wanted to oh, go sure, through. Go ahead. Um, I've lost it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but it was whether uh, your bootcamp goes through setting up a virtual classroom. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but it, 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 is it's getting a bootcamp uh, help, uh, helping with creating a virtual classroom. Oh, yeah. From yes, that was, yes. That's, that's, what the, that's what the bootcamp is about. It's, okay. it's a remote, yeah, it's a virtual classroom, remote educator bootcamp. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it too much because I've mentioned it too many times. But maybe Kuba, if you post a link in the oh, chat yeah. there, and uh, just guys, just click on the link and go have a look at it. But the idea of the bootcamp is within two weeks that you will be empowered with the fundamental skills to become a remote educator. We actually have a graduate bootcamp as well that brings you beyond that for another six weeks, and it's all free, of course, for another six weeks. So we bring you through the fundamental skills of creating a virtual classroom. And we help you. We help you move beyond that as well. So I don't want to talk about it too much. It, it specifically. So just click click the link, um, and all the information is there. And please do join us. It's free. Uh, we've got like fantastic feedback from school so far. Um, average teachers saying it's more than double their confidence in remote teaching. So yeah, click the link, have a look, and please join us. Awesome. Back to you, Bart. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. We're almost um, out of time, but however, I wanted to share some um, feedback we got from you and the reactions um, um, and illustrations of how teaching um, is uh, provided these days by so many of you. So if we could go to slide number eight, Rashawn. Maybe I can... We, maybe we can leave it on um, as this so you can read uh, what was provided here by Sydney and here by Adele. So thank you for your feedback and illustrations. I wanted to focus briefly during those last minutes of our webinar on engaging learners. And here's a question right here, lower uh, corner, lower right corner of our slide. The question goes, how to be effective during an online lesson? What are three essential things? How to engage learners? Can you provide us with your take, Rashawn and Gavin? Well, is this online synchronous or online asynchronous? Because I think those are two, well, there, my answers would vary there. I, I would say- Let's go for synchronous. I mean, I think even it, under any conditions, maybe I shouldn't even give it that, that qualifier. Like you want there to be a clear, goal that is shared and, and is explicit and you want to figure out what is going to be the best and most authentic way under the conditions for students to demonstrate progress towards that goal and that by nature if that's done well that is going to give the learners some way to practice and then demonstrate the thing that you're having them do right so you, you can design those types of uh, elements um, online but I think that it's that feedback that, that not only is it just consuming and receiving uh, concepts or ideas, but then also how can you uh, practice working with that concept and idea and then demonstrate some form of transferable understanding. Like that has to be uh, built into it. Um, and then from there, you like say on the platform, how am I going to do it? Like, am I going to have a Google doc that's going to be a back channel? Am I giving a checklist of uh, three websites to go to practice certain skills? Am I going to have students create their own explainer video and submit it as a form of demonstrating understanding? I mean, there's there's endless choices, but I think it's that that attention to designing for that feedback and assessment loop that is what will make any any instruction, but especially online or distance instruction, more effective. Great, Gavin. What would be your suggestion? Yeah, I mean, Roshan pretty much hit the nail on the head there. I would just just add to that and say, you know, be empathetic. Um, don't stress yourself. So be empathetic to, your, to the students. Remember, they're in a stressful situation. You know, we don't want to be looking all the time for all the bells and whistles on everything. Um, sometimes if they're just tuning in and getting something done, that might be a win. Uh, try to 
you know, be there for them and understand how they're feeling uh, emotionally. Uh, don't stress yourself out and try and think you should be this super bionic teacher and don't think any and don't think the rest of the world has suddenly become one because they aren't. Trust me. Um, there's that. And then I would say, yeah, I mean, go with your own teaching style. You know, find one or two platforms you really like that reflect how you would typically engage students in the classroom and find something that lets you replicate that digitally. Uh, and oftentimes you'll find something uh, digitally that's that's way better and, it, and it's going to be a huge win for you because you're going to go, you know, well, wow, that's something I always love doing with, with the students. But doing it uh, non-digitally, can't think of a word. Uh, what's the word? Non-digital? Analog. Thank you. <laughs> doing something non-digitally. We're going to do something uh, uh, analogous. Oh, forget it. Doing something non-digitally. Um, uh, uh, you know, often you, when you jump to digitally, you go, okay, well, now I can do this a, a thousand different ways. And it, it's, it's really cool. So, you know, keep your eye open. For, don't stress yourself out. Find the tools you, you think are going to really help suit your teaching style. And then as you get more comfortable with them, just see what opportunities are there that aren't there uh, normally. I mean, just with explain everything alone, for instance, we touched on creating explainer videos for the students, then creating explainer videos for you. You doing something like we're doing here now, which is like an amazing collaborative use uh, use of it. Um, other things like, for instance, you create the start of a video. Um, you create slide one on the video. Um, when we looked at uh, in the boot camp was the water cycle, and we had the four four different labels in the water cycle. We explained them briefly, then asked the students to add four more slides, and dedicate each slide to one part of the water cycle. So you know, it's just looking for those really simple ways you can take knowledge you have, even the basic knowledge, and use it in new creative ways. Uh, look out for ways for collaboration and all these things. There's just such there's so many cool things out there, but going back to what I said originally, just be empathetic to the students. Don't stress yourself out uh, and keep things, keep things practical. You know, sometimes just a Google form to ask them how they're feeling uh, a little, a little quiz, whether it's for assessment or just a fun quiz, um, you know, look up icebreakers, Google icebreakers, you know, just fun things like that. I mean, might work or, or um, what else can be nice doing little, little, um, little like a uh, small uh, uh, Rashan touched on it. Doing little small like like Zoom calls or or meet Google Meets and just chatting with students in small groups, you know, just look out for these these opportunities and stay within your own confidence zone. Don't stress yourself out. Great, thank you for sharing that. And as we're wrapping up our webinar, I hope we had more time we had for answering all of those remaining questions. Obviously, obviously we couldn't explain everything today, but if you can provide us with your feedback um, and suggest if this session is actually helpful for you, what kind of information would like to receive from us. We're happy to, to follow up with the next session and explore uh, those concepts, those questions that you have even more. For the time being, I wanted to thank you, Gavin, and thank you, Rashan, for being today with us. And thank you for uh, joining us, everyone that participated. That was that was a great exchange. We hope we explained a bit, if not explain, if not everything. Kuba, do you have any closing thoughts from your perspective as you kept this alternative alternative uh, conversation on the chat and Q and A? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you again uh, to everyone who who joined in and who participated in the talk on the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, that's some great, great insights. Uh, we are happy to learn from you. So thank you very much. And yeah, great talk, guys. Awesome. It's a challenging time for everyone um, here um, as well. So let's try to make sure that learning never stops. Uh, and thank you again. Hope to see you next time. And thank you, Bart, for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thanks. See you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.